The Australian Investors Podcast is brought to you by BetaShares, serving over 1 million investors across Australia's broadest range of ETFs. After years of record low interest rates, income-seeking investors have been returning to cash and fixed income ETFs, drawn by the attractive returns on offer. Equity income funds have also been generating healthy income streams. BetaShares provides yield-hungry investors with a range of income-focused funds to choose from, including ETFs offering exposure to cash, bonds, hybrids, Australian shares, and international shares. To explore the BetaShares ETF range, visit betashares.com.au and consider if the fund is right for you. I'm also proud to say that this episode of the Australian Investors Podcast is brought to you by The Intelligent Investor, Australia's premier investment research membership service. You can get a free trial for 15 days, no credit card details required. To access the insights of some of Australia's best analysts, including buy, hold, and sell share recommendations, click the link in your podcast player to secure your Intelligent Investor membership today. Hey there, here's a quick note. This podcast contains general financial advice only. That means it's not specific to you, your needs, goals, or objectives. So don't act on the information until you've spoken with your financial advisor. You'll find our full disclosure, disclaimer, and link to our financial services guide in the show notes. This conversation features Nick Crocker. It originally appeared on the Australian Business Podcast, our newest podcast channel that is really taking off in 2023. If you want to learn more about what it takes to start a successful business, how to scale up your existing business, or even how to manage people and teams far better than you do now, consider subscribing to the Australian Business Podcast in your podcast player right now. Without further ado, Here's the podcast with Nick Crocker of Blackbird Ventures. The conversation you're about to hear with Nick Crocker, a multiple time founder and investor, is one of the best conversations I've ever had on any RASC podcast ever. This conversation covers life, investing, what it takes to start a business, mental health, and so many other things which are vital to running a business and succeeding over the long term. It's a fantastic conversation for anyone who is thinking of starting a business, for an investor in any type of business, or to someone who is going about their day wondering what makes people tick. I hope you enjoy this conversation with Nick Crocker of Blackbird Ventures. Nick, thanks for taking some time to join me on the podcast. Glad to be here. We're going to talk about entrepreneurialism. We're going to talk about investing, lessons learned. I think we'll even bring in things that are more personal, behavioral, it's going to be pretty wide ranging. To kick things off, though, some I got some maybe some quick fire questions, some some short answer questions. If this was a test, the first one is, and this is the same one that I asked Nikki. Uh, what's one investment you got wrong? Thinking about this this morning, I think the cop out answer is we get them all wrong. Because <laughs> um, kind of where that question is going is, you want me to call out a you know a particular investment that went really wrong that we thought was going to be great, but actually. I think the answer, the one I got most wrong is a company called Dovetail mm. and we were, um, we led the seed round and one thing you try and, you try and do when you're an investor is to invest in category creating companies and invest in the one that becomes a defining company in the category. So, the canonical example is Salesforce as the mm. defining CRM business. But I just really liked Benjamin and Brad and I thought they were exceptional product people but I didn't think when I did the investment that I was onto a category category creator necessarily. Fast forward three, four years and they are the the leading company in the user research space and that has become a category where people believe, um, me included, that there's a billion dollar business to be built there or a multi-billion dollar business. Hmm. And I would love to say that I saw that coming but if you read my memo from 2018, it was just his two guys who built incredible product with incredible focus and care and actually, a lot of the doubts that I got when I talked about the investment was people thought this wasn't going to be big enough. There weren't enough people who were going to use this. But their mission now is to improve the quality of everything and we suddenly have a category. And mm. so, I, I'm i going to flip it and make it a positive and I got that one wrong to the upside where it became much bigger and more impactful than I thought it would. Hmm. That's a good answer. I love it. Thanks. Um, so, if you could absorb, acquire, inherit one skill with the click of a finger. So, not talking about like invisibility or something 
like a superpower, but something that you maybe have uh, a habit or a hobby that you've tried to hone and turn into something. If you could get one of those skills, what would it be? It's, it's going to shock you. Mm. Analyzing financial statements. <laughs> really? <laughs> because- <laughs> I did not expect that. <laughs> when I look at those things, like they just don't make intuitive sense to me. But there are some people that can understand an entire business through just a couple of lists of numbers, basically. Mm. And that isn't how business makes sense in my brain. But I would love to add that to my I would, th- there's a there's an intuitiveness that, to what I do and a belief in people that drives every decision I make that I would love to layer on with that quantitative brilliance around analyzing financial statements and uh, that would be the skill I would give myself overnight. Wow. That's going to, okay, that would, that's setting, okay, there's so many follow-up questions, but I'll, I'll leave Ask them. Ask them, let's do it. No, so, so what do, so you said like that you, in essence, like business is about, like intuitively you think business is about like people and systems. I guess, could you, like, do you ever look at the financial statements or like what a company is saying? Like, I know you invest a lot pre-revenue, right? Yeah. So, in those companies, there's not much to look at. And of course, I do when it comes to board meetings. But I was at the Sohn conference the other day for my first time ever. And if people don't know, it's a really, um, it brings together a lot of the best portfolio managers in the country to pitch their best idea, among yeah. other things. And I remember thinking, as I heard about all these pitches, I was like, I just can't judge whether this is a good pitch or not until I go and meet the CEO and the <laughs> founder. And for the most part, people do, when people do that, they get what they call two hours with management. At best, we get access to management and then they talk about management came from Harvard and they were used to run product at insert big company here. But neither of those things are, well, first of all, it's the, the, the song and dance you get in two hours from management is not the real people. Mm. And then the where did you used to work is just actually the dumbest filter that exists. <laughs> it has no predictive capacity whatsoever. Um and so I just, that's, you know, to, to the extent that I try and understand public companies, the thing I struggle with is just how can you judge a public company unless you know intimately what that founder is like? And I'm talking obviously here about um, um, founder CEO led businesses, which is what we invest in. But to the extent that I do any personal public markets investing, it's always in founder CEOs, the Tobys from Shopify, the Mike and Scott from Atlassian, because I just don't know any other way to understand how business can work if I don't have some fundamental belief in the people b- behind it have you ever sold an investment purely because there was a change in the ceo or the founder stepped down no we haven't um but often practically speaking you can't sell yeah a s- early seed stage business with a founder transition like that's kind of in a sense an unsellable business um i did go through on the public market side a couple of years ago i sold every company i held that had a glass door score b- below 4.0 <laughs> <laughs> which was uh in retrospect i don't know if it was a great idea so some good companies in that list but um i uh yeah we've never we've never sold a company because of a change of founder have we been impacted as a co- have we seen companies impacted by changes of founder early on de- definitely and profoundly yeah is it ever for the better Yes, yeah, right. <laughs> there are some dark situations that you, you get into where you, you sort of your hands are tied. You have to make the decision, but for the most part, I would say uh, founder CEO transitions in the first two to three years of a business are predictive of failure, not success. Mm. Um, okay, so I asked you for an investment that you got wrong. Let's, well, there's going to be a lot more optimism throughout the show. Um, which investment has taught you the most? I would say Nura. So, okay. Nura is a headphone company based here in Melbourne. Um, Office is above a wedding shop in Brunswick <laughs> and the team made the best sounding headphones in the world for the last five years. Is that actually like judged? Mm, it's judged in the sense that the technology breakthrough of Nura is that you conduct a hearing test in the same way you conduct a hearing test on someone who needed a hearing aid. And then you adjust each headphone for each ear so that it delivers perfect sound to you. So, uh, (laughs) subjective personal judgment, but there's no other headphone in the world that does that. And I joined the board. So, I had an early early part of my career in the music industry. Mm. Uh, Nikki and Rick asked me to join the Nura board actually before I joined Blackbird, 
um, they just saw it as a they saw me as the right partner to that business, and so that that business has tracked my entire Blackbird career, and uh, it's just the business that's had to face everything: COVID, supply chain issues, founder transitions, uh, and D 2 C, the D 2 C hitting the wall of iOS fourteen, uh, and it's it's gone the full journey. How do you spell Neuro? N U R A. Okay. Yeah. I thought so. Just wanted to confirm. So if people wanted to look it up, that's uh, that's quite curious. I, I mean, your background, I know a bit about it. So, uh, and we can get to that. But there is something, and I, I, I know you've been asked this so many times on podcasts before, but I, I kind of have to bring it up just in case someone hasn't come across this. Um, and I think this is going to help us frame a lot of that later conversation that we're going to have. Can you introduce us to the idea of the elephants, what it is, how it came to be, how it started, and yeah, maybe we'll just go from there. Okay, cool. So, there'll be a link in the show notes yep. to the elephants Absolutely. post. And if you just do, if this is the end of your listening to this podcast, you can shut it off now and go look, just go read the elephants post. Yep. That's, if that's the only thing I leave you with, let that be it. So, as a friend of mine, Simon Kalinowski, who I think had been a part of YPO, mm-hmm. which is um, Young Professionals Organization, I think is the name, but it's basically a, a group of eight to 12 people that you go through the journey of business with to, and, and really share the most intimate details of your life. YPO is not accessible to everyone. And so, at 23, when I started this, YPO was not accessible to me. I was not mm. su- successful or rich enough to be a part of YPO. Mm-hmm. So, Simon's suggestion to myself, Ben Johnston, another entrepreneur in, um, in Brisbane, and, uh, and Scott Mackay, who um, has since passed away but, but was part of the founding group of the Elephants, was let's get together once a quarter, let's tell each other who we want to be in life, and let's hold each other accountable to that vision. And so, I wrote a post in 2013 where I outlined exactly what the Elephants is, and 10 years on, it's still connecting with people, mm. and- I got a Twitter DM from someone I'd never met just last week saying, I started my own elephants group and it's changed my life. And it's just weird. Sometimes you write things and you're just telling, sharing something that you did that you've been doing for many years. So, it doesn't seem that remarkable to you, but for it to be here 10 years on and for it still to be connecting with people is really powerful. And it's just a really simple idea of assemble a group of three of your, it's not your best friends, but it's the friends you can trust the most. Tell them who you want to be, be be vulnerable with them, and then have them help you reflect back. Are you, you know, quarter on quarter on quarter, are you really becoming that person? Are you getting closer to that person or getting further away? Mm. And so, the posts, it's called The Elephant, sets out in quite a lot of detail how we do that. And it's, yeah, been probably the greatest sort of personal, having an elephant's group has been the greatest personal kind of change that I've experienced and, and I started it, I'm 39 now, so it's been 16 years. I mm. uh, had a, the first elephants group when I moved to the US, I started a new elephants group. Right now, I don't have an elephants group, but I kind of run my own and we talked about this a bit before the call, which is how important it is as a business owner to send monthly updates to your investors. Mm. It's just as important to do a weekly, monthly, quarterly update on yourself and your own progress, even if you don't send it to anyone. And you just write it for yourself. Mm. So I think that process of writing what you want, hard to know what you want, hard to be hard to be accurate at defining what you want, and then difficult to be consistent in, in pursuing that and just being unapologetic in making the sacrifices you need to go and get that thing that you want. How did you know that those guys were the right fit to be elephants with you? Well, I didn't. I was kind of caught up in it. They they were more confident and well established and successful than I was when when we first met. And so I just went along with it. I just went along with it. But we went we went to uh, Byron Bay that first weekend. Got an Airbnb, and we just we just sat around and each person spent basically half a day saying, "Here's what I want my life to be." And then everyone just gave really honest, vulnerable, kind of caring feedback. And I was just like, "This is absolutely." amazing so i was lucky that we had a group that was able to tap into that you know i credit simon with with driving it and having the insight for what it needed to be and then you know it was just it was just alchemy i think we got lucky that we had the right group 
Um, and I think when people email me, the, the question they ask the most about it is, how do I pick the group? And I don't think it's close friends. I don't think close friends is the right proxy, but I think you should go, who can I share my bank balance with and have them not be either jealous or judge me? Mm. Who can I talk to about quality of my relationship with my partner and have know that I can share vulnerability and, and fear in that area and have them not hold that against me or use that against me? So it's trying to think through who are the people you'd be most comfortable sharing awkward things with. And that's often not your close friends group or the people you see the most. There's, there's other people in your life who you will feel on a different wavelength with on the trust side. And those are the people to try and put around you. And yeah, you'd be surprised when, when everyone is expected to hold that trust very dearly, mm. how good human beings are at doing it. Yeah, so this is as soon as I read it, I think I saw it in your Twitter, in your Twitter handle, uh, the elephant, and I think I may have heard of it on a couple of podcasts that you've done. Um, I thought, where can I find this because I need this in my life, and I think it's hit home even more recently because I've only recently started seeing a, a business coach or like a life coach that informs me uh, about how to run myself and how to run the business, and then also a psych. Like seeing a psychologist was like that's kind of like my elephant of one. Um, I don't see a bank balances necessarily, but it's definitely the, the things that are really intimate. And I got to say, like, if I could find that times four, then that would be incredible. Um, so if anyone is listening to this and they think they might fit, uh, let me know. Send me a message. I mean, so it's interesting for me, right? As the you know the person that documented this concept, I don't want to call myself the creator, but I documented it, and it's it, it's I get credited with it. Um, I, not having a group right now is something that I'm actually searching for. So I have a list, I have a Trello card oh, cool. with a bunch of people that are like potential elephants, but yeah. I'm not ready yet to ask them because I'm still getting to know them mm. still before I kind of r reveal everything. Like yeah. it, it's a slow process, but there are definitely people and, and you grow a lot, right, in life. Mm. And when you put yourself under pressure, as anyone who's an entrepreneur or founder does, anyone who's like really pushing the edge of what they're capable of, you grow really fast and not everyone grows at the same rate. So I think it's mm. okay to, to cycle through groups of elephants, whether it's a geographical lens, whether it's just interests and, and how you grow. I think cycling through elephants is fine. But I'm looking for, I want one too. Yeah. <laughs> you and me are in the same yeah, boat. Yeah, we're both looking for it. Um, how long... Like, did the original group last? Like, because you said there was two? You mean three, three two? of us. Three. Yeah, me plus three. Yep. Oh, it's a good question. I would say three or f three years. Like, the, the great tragedy is, is Scott died when he was 27. Mm. And that he was the glue of the group. And I honestly, it's sort of raw to talk about it, but the group didn't recover after that. And I moved to the US mm. and that didn't help either. But- I think had Scott stayed alive, we would have we would have persisted a lot longer than we did, and it's just one of my one of the great tragedies of my life that that Scott died, but in the way he did. So um, mm. uh, it, it was a couple of years, and then while I was in the US, I, I formed another group, and that was that was awesome while it lasted. But again, I moved home; everyone had kids. It just started to started to fade, and uh, yeah. So now I search again. Yeah, um, I feel like a question might be why is it called elephant elephants. There's a John Donne poem and the line is elephants, nature's truly harmless, great thing. Mm. And it was just this idea of in the pursuit of greatness, you can cause so much harm to the people around you. And I just love the concept of the elephant becoming the elephant as one of the one of the world's great animals, but in a harmless way. So it was this, this idea of finding a different path um, to greatness where, you know, I think pursuit of greatness is is selfish on some level mm. but minimizing the impact you have in a negative way on those around you i think is is the right way to pursue that although you know i don't think i've achieved greatness so what would i know but <laughs> <laughs> um it may be that, that greatness actually re requires harm but that, that was the concept um, so it, was a, it was a line from a john dunn poem and it just stuck mm. so people like many people that listen to this will know of you and some of the things that you've done. But can you take us back? Obviously, you weren't born this way. So 
can you take us back and tell us a little bit about like start wherever you want to start and tell us about some of the milestones or, or things that you've done along the way and in particular was there did someone else help you plant the seed of taking risk like was there parents or mentors or anyone like that in your life yeah it was the elephants that that group so i was a journalist I had a column in the Sunday Mail, which was Brisbane's big Sunday paper, like the Herald Sun of Melbourne. Yep. And the purpose of that column was I did not know what I wanted to do with my life. I was 22, 23, so it's probably like a lot of 23-year-olds not still figuring it out. But I thought, how can I get impressive people to talk to me? And turns out that if you say I'm a journalist, <laughs> people will respond to your emails, especially if you're a journalist at a, at a well-read paper. And so... I got the column as a means of just meeting people who I thought were interesting to figure out whether I wanted to be like them. And so I just cycled through every kind of impressive person I could find. And I met entrepreneurs. I was 20, yeah, 24, 25 when I met on, like, it was like, I specifically said, I'm going to go and meet an entrepreneur and see if being an entrepreneur sounds like a good idea, which tells you how distant that was from what, the way I yeah. grew up. We, I, I think about my, my seven-year-old and- he is just surrounded by founders, hmm. fr- friends of ours, colleagues. He sits in in my and he overhears my Zoom calls. Like he and I could not be more different in mm. that I'd, I'm at 25 meeting, um, uh, 25 discovering what entrepreneurship is and he's seven and he comes in and sometimes I'm in board meetings and Mike Cannon-Brooks is the chair of our board and Robin Denham, who's the chair of Tesla, is our operating partner and he just walks in and just sits on my lap and listens to <laughs> two of the great <laughs> business minds in Australian history just sitting there. So, so it was so foreign to me, the whole concept. And it was almost like a breakthrough, like, oh, so you can get a job or you can create jobs for other people. I didn't realize there was a whole subsector of people that create jobs for other people. Hmm. But it was, it was, yeah, it was like, this is, this is another one you should put in the show notes. So, the, the, yeah. uh, Toto Wolf runs the Mercedes F1 team. Mm. And there's a New Yorker profile of him that just came out. That's just to be, it's just so good. It's just an incredible, incredible profile about an incredible human being. But he talked about the first time that he sort of discovered cars and F1. And it was sort of as if his life was before, there's, there's, there's his life before that point and life after that point. And I think, I think of the night that I met, um, uh, ben, Scott, Simon, and Josh, and just walked in to write this profile of this group of entrepreneurs that worked from a co-working space in Brisbane. And I just was, my life changed after that. And so, they were the ones that said, just stop what you're doing and become an entrepreneur, basically. I was like, what the hell are you doing with your life? And I needed I needed that belief and that push. And I, got, I was lucky to get it. It sort of, did I get it late or early? Who knows? But I got it at the right time. Mm. Because you studied law, right? Mm. And grew up slightly inland from Noosa, was it? Or? Yeah, 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 just like 40 minutes north of Noosa. Uh, if you've ever been north of Noosa, you might have gone to Boreen Point while I lived at Alanda Point, which is further out, mm. um, sort of towards Gympie. Yep. 12 acres, very idyllic upbringing and surrounded by rainforest. My dad was a woodworker. Hmm. So, he was home a lot, always in, his, in the shed making furniture. Um, and yeah, just grew up playing golf and eating fruit off the trees and- building my own little golf, little putt-putt golf course and basketball and my brother skating. And it was just like, we live so far from town that it was sort of a big deal to get into town. So, you had to kind of make your own fun. Yeah. But it's a beautiful place to, beautiful physical place to grow up. Have you ever thought about um, folks who grow up in the country and whether there's any alignment between rural living and taking risk and entrepreneurship? It's something I'm still working through at the moment because I, when I went to university, and this is, maybe this is a Brisbane thing, but there was a the first question you got asked in law was what school did you go to, and people were asking actually what private school did you go to, so I can kind of figure out who you are. Yeah, and the answer for me was Good Shepherd Lutheran College in Noosa, and I don't think a lot of I would get blank stares when I said that. And that's no disrespect to Good Shepherd, but it wasn't. People wanted me to say Brisbane Grammar or whatever other private school is up there but it's been interesting to see the journey of all the kind of elite private school folks that i went to through through law with um and then I, and then if i look at the backgrounds of the people that we fund now there's they're from all kinds of places like mm. you kind of 
I guess the, I guess it's not about private or public school, rural or or city living. It's about does your upbringing create some imbalance in you that you feel the need to correct, and sort of the greater the imbalance, the more you seek to correct it, the more that's where you get. I think if you look at across, you know, 100 people on average, there will just be one or two who are psychotically driven, competitive, kind of just they have an internal force that others just don't. That's how I see the world. And you can find that force in a bunch of different places. But um, generally, it comes from um, a lack of something. I think that I think the strongest forces come from trying to fill a gap that that maybe is impossible. And you, I don't know, anyone who does a little bit of psychology and executive coaching will pretty much find what that thing is for them. Not not everything that you seek out is coming from a great place of sort of healthy balance. I think imbalance is okay. Um, and so I think part of what's growing up in it, for me, a huge part of growing up in a rural area was just, I felt so out of place for my whole childhood and so embarrassed to be ambitious and so part of the joy in what I do now is making it okay for other people to be insanely ambitious. And that's part of my drive. And like, why do I still at 39 carry the, the bad feelings of shame that I had from like, like mm. I just, I remember being 16, like wanting to be the best person that I could be and thinking like, I better not tell anyone this. Hmm. This is not going to get me any credibility in the schoolyard. And yeah, I love to be the unlocker of the to give people permission to to be unashamedly ambitious. That's the best thing about this job. Why? Where did that come from from you? Like, why did you think there was shame around that? I remember going to going to a new school in grade five, and someone just saying to me, "Oh, you're a square." I remember thinking, "Not sure what that means. It doesn't sound like it's a positive." <laughs> yeah. And yeah, I was just like, I try. I always tried my best at sport. I always tried my best academically. Like I just, I just was a striver. And I think there's a part of Australian culture and maybe Queensland culture. And apologies to anyone who's in Queensland, but it's definitely it was stronger in Queensland for me than it, than it than it was anywhere else. There's a um, the tall poppy syndrome is alive and well. Mm. Um, and yeah, you don't want to stick your head up too high. Yeah, that's something I was actually talking about this morning. Um, in another discussion, I was saying that it's a shame, you know, because I I also don't agree necessarily with like the moniker that is um, success. Like we rank success in terms of financial wealth. I don't necessarily that is it. It may be a determinant, but it's not the key determinant for success in my opinion. Uh, but I find the tall poppy syndrome here in Australia is really strong. And if, even if we just go across the pond a little bit, you know, to New Zealand, I find they punch above their weight, I think, in many respects. And I don't know if the culture is that different, but at the same time, then we look further abroad, you know, North America and places like that, where success and risk-taking is rewarded in the sense that it's, yeah, okay, gave it a shot, didn't work. You know, that's okay. That's okay. It's still a success. Or if here, if it's like, you get too far ahead of yourself. Everyone's just quick to pull you back. And this is not like a knock. This is, I think this is changing. I would say like, I don't have any literature on this, but I would say that it's changing. Mm. And I say that we are getting better at managing that. But I think that's what innovation needs is it needs a culture of acceptance around that. And sometimes that rules will be broken and there'll be, you know, a, an impact. Mm. But I think for the most part, that's a net positive for our society. Yeah, and I think in the startup bubble, and I acknowledge that I do live in a startup bubble, the tall pit poppy syndrome has ceased to exist. There's a genuine hmm. joy in the success of others, I think, because we we know that Atlassian makes startups a genuine career choice for thousands of kids coming out of high school, and then Canva proves that Atlassian wasn't a fluke, and then the next 10 years should hold another three, five, ten Atlassian canvas size success stories for us to continue to perpetuate um, the startup ecosystem in Australia. And I know the startup, I know that tall poppy syndrome exists, but it doesn't exist in the world I exist in. And that's a great relief. Mm, must be nice. <laughs> um, so you studied law, then worked as a journalist. 
then you come across these guys and you think this entrepreneur thing sounds kind of interesting. Can you take us through what you did? Did you learn to code? Did you did you do any of those things that are very stereotypical of working in a startup environment? Yeah, it's a bit of a convoluted story. I don't know if it'll be good listening, but here's how it goes. So I meet those guys. My best friend from high school, his partner worked at a digital agency and they were advertising a role for the first employee of a business. It was called Musicadium and its job was to get independent musicians to put their music on iTunes. Hmm. And I applied and I got it. Hmm. And so I was effectively a startup CEO without having founded the business. And to me, I was like, this sounds so much fun because I was a music journalist while I was studying. And so I guess they looked at me and went, he's got a, he's studying law and he's a music journalist. It's, you know, I think my salary was 55 grand. So I think they were just happy to have me mm. and only employee. And I just had to figure it out. So I got to put training wheels on as a startup CEO four weeks after I met these guys. Like it would all <laughs> serendipitously happened and I would never would have taken it had they not all said, okay, perfect, go do it, hurry up. So I figured out digital music in 2007, 2008, 2009, like how music is consumed on the internet. And then I started writing about it. And then I became known as a digital music expert. And then I had music labels and music managers reach out to me proactively and want to talk to me and want to ask questions about the internet. And I, f I left the, the Musicadium business to start an agency consulting to... Um, EMI and MySpace and a whole bunch of marketing agencies who had music strategies. And I just became the digital music guy. Hmm. And my first business was that I founded was an agency called Native Digital. And then out of Native Digital, we did a side project uh, called We Are Hunted um, with, a, with a group called What News that, that um, Graham hmm. Wood had founded or had funded, I should say. Stephen Phillips was and um, Richard Sutter were the founders. And then We Are Hunted became um, really popular and that sort of, it all just kind of spirals from there. Mm. I have a little bit, I'd say, rudimentary understanding of what We Are Hunted was. Can you tell us um, like that journey that you went on? Um, I don't think you've ever like disclosed, like, but there was the exit. Um, maybe you can just take us through that part of your life because I think it, this, I think the, the velocity, something that I was talked about with Nikki was like the velocity of uh, startups is really important. And, you know, being agile just in trying things is super important as well. So I think that helps us bed down the next step. Yeah. So We Are 100 was a music website that told you what the 99 most popular songs on the internet were that day. Um, and we were still transitioning. This is pre-Spotify where most people who were finding new music were finding it by going into music blogs and downloading MP3s. Mm. And so we were just scraping these music blogs and just going, well, this one keeps getting, this song keeps getting mentioned. It must be more popular than the song that's getting mentioned half as much. And the way that the What News guys did it just made, just made it a really interesting playlist to come back to. And, um, uh, ben Johnson from Joseph Mark and Jess Huddart, um, she designed it and it was just a beautiful design, a source of great music and it was just the right idea for the right time. But to your point about speed, seven weeks after we launched it, um, we sold it to, you know, we sold the majority of it back to Graham Wood and because he was like, hey, um, what's this What's this business? Let's either, let's either fund it properly or... In my recollection, it's always funny how you remember these things. But I remember he said, I'm going to invest a million dollars in this and you guys better invest a million dollars to maintain your stake or, or sell it to me. And I was, I was so naive and I didn't know what I was doing. So, we sold it. And so, I basically got the like <laughs> launch to exit in seven, seven weeks. Um, and then they they took it from there, and and so when the, when it was exited to Twitter, it exited to Twitter because of the work and the and the time that they'd put into it. Mm. Um, but I just got yeah, I got the full startup journey in eight weeks, and <laughs> it was a good education. Seems like uh, like even being a CEO of a one man team, um, and then this, like, it seems like fortuitous. Like that you would be there. Um, like I'm not taking anything away from you. Just saying like it seems like this was a super rich opportunity in terms of being there to sow the seeds on these things and see them come to life very quickly. 
It's quite unique. Let me give you a random story about how fortuitous it is. So I'm a rugby, okay. I grew up in Queensland. Massive, I was born in Newcastle. Massive rugby league fan. One of my heroes growing up was Andrew Johns, halfback for the Newcastle Knights, greatest rugby league player of all time, arguably. <laughs> friend of mine was a friend of his. He was playing for the Kangaroos in um, Brisbane and I uh, was doing a bushwalk in Tasmania with my, um, my wife and now wife and her dad. And I made us all leave Tasmania a day early so I could go back to be there for the test to meet my hero and at the time, Andrew Johns. That fell through. I couldn't go meet Andrew Johns. But it meant that I could attend a talk that night that I'd been invited to. And at that talk, I met Stephen Phillips and Stephen and I <laughs> went on to launch We Aren't It. <laughs> so, yes, anyone who tells you that they aren't, they aren't lucky is lying or not acknowledging the true set of facts. Um... But over a long enough time span, you get luck and then you just get opportunities to just work your ass off in kind of uh, when no one's seeing. So you get, sometimes you get lucky and sometimes you have to grind. And so like anytime I see someone quote unquote get lucky, I know there was probably nine years or 10 years before that moment mm. when no one gave a shit about them and they were miserable and wondering why it was, why they should be doing it. and. So look over the court. You do get you know you want to you want to stick around long enough to get lucky a few times. You don't need to get lucky in business. You don't need to get lucky that often for it to be life changing. But um, yeah, I I could run you through 15, 20, 50, 100 examples of getting lucky. You know, like Nikki asked me. Nikki, the founder of Blackbird, asked me if I would help him find someone to run Starmate in San Francisco. And I spent three weeks trying to find that person and then thought, actually, I could probably give it a crack. You know, like I was lucky that he asked me. I was lucky that I didn't find, if I'd found, if one of my friends wanted to do it, I wouldn't be, it wouldn't be a Blackbird. I think, I think life is more full of these moments than people realize. Like I, I met my wife when we went to the same college at the University of Queensland she only came to my college because she didn't get into another college for some dumb administrative reason. So, like, I have an administrator at some Queensland college to thank <laughs> for the fact that I met my wife at 18 and now we've been together 20 years. I mean, life is full of that stuff. Yeah. One thing you said there about, like, sometimes luck. It seems like it's luck, but, you know, it's that old cliche of it's an overnight success in 10 years, right? Like, you don't see all of the work that duck paddling, you know, ferociously just to, just to move or stay still. Um can you talk us through the business sessions? Yeah. It, it would seem to me, so again, like I'm in doing some research, it seems like it's a it was a platform or an app that, that connected people, like connected someone yeah. that needed an, an expert help, health and fitness, so important, uh, and brought them together. Yeah. Um, like this is a problem like we see with platform businesses all around in many verticals. Yeah. Well, let's, let's define sessions as not a success for starters. Okay. We, we sold it, but yeah. it's not a, it wasn't a success because it doesn't exist today. Like success to me is timelessness, is hmm. build something that's still here 10, 20, 30 years from now. Sessions doesn't exist. We Hunted doesn't exist. Native Digital doesn't exist. None of the businesses that I started or co-started exist today. And so none of them are successful in my view. Hmm. Um, sessions was, I grew up, my mum was a GP. And so she, I just think at some level I embedded the importance of health and the importance of having a person in your life to be your health person mm -hmm. as some really critical part of life. I was really fascinated by behavior change and I thought the one place in behavior change where I think I could have an impact on others is around physical health so exercise. And so I set up this business sessions with my co-founder Ben Hartney and we built basically a personal trainer in your pocket focused on getting you healthier and living a healthier, better life. Mm. And this was again, 20, this was pre-Instagram, so pre that kind of Instagram fitness influencer buzz craze and um, pre the iPhone out, pre the iPhone, sorry, or early on in the iPhone journey. So that's 2009, so we started just after that. And I just figured that people would pay to have a health coach in their pocket to improve the way they lived. It was a really good experience. I learned so much from it, but it was not a successful business. And we sold it to my fitness pal because we just ran out of ideas for how we could grow the business. We just couldn't acquire customers effectively. Looking back, the move would have been to go hard on Instagram when Instagram launched. Mm. I didn't see that coming. And so we sold because we 
we needed to be part of something bigger than, than and we just couldn't get there. We just looked at it and we were like, if we want to influence a million people, if we keep doing it at the rate we're doing it, we might not do that in 10 years or we could join my fitness pal tomorrow and and influence. And I remember the first thing I ever launched at my fitness pal was a tutorial on how to use the app because we saw that people, the num- one of the number one reasons people dropped off my fitness pal was they just didn't know how to log a food. So I made yeah. people log a food on the onboarding. And I remember we calculated like the uplift in people that would would come back on day three and therefore the flow through effect of how, whether they would hit their weight goal. And it was sort of like that single change meant that a million more people would hit their weight goal over the next three years just super from that. Super rewarding. Yeah. Super rewarding. And so that was, you know, we just had, a, we were able to have a lot more impact inside my fitness pal as employees than we did with our own thing that wasn't wasn't working that in the way it needed to. I got to admit, when I've used my fitness pal, still use it, um, and I I learn how to create meals and do all that sort of stuff. Everyone like it's like it feels like a learning like learning curve, and then everyone gets it and they're like, "Wow, powerful!" <laughs> yeah, I yeah. got it. <laughs> um, I I guess one of the things that strikes me as curious about platform businesses uh, is the you have to cultivate the growth on two sides. So when you said before that you couldn't acquire customers you're talking about like users not yeah. like every personal trainer was keen to join yeah. and see get okay. new business but it was hard to convince people to pay what we're we charging 29 79 i can't remember the exact number less than 79 yeah yeah <laughs> i'm glad you did the research <laughs> it was hard to get people to pay 79 dollars a month to have a personal trainer in their pocket um and we just couldn't explain the value of it and it was valuable when people had it but it was just health health is a difficult place in terms of the way how you what people buy in healthcare is often not what works. Put it that way. Mm. And so sometimes you just you 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 are buying something that you want to just work instantaneously. And anyone who's tried to change their health knows that it's a very long process. And so we just we just couldn't we just we just failed to connect with people. Fa- failed to make something people wanted to use the Y Combinator mm. phrase. We uh we have. I, th- I told you the numbers off air, but. We have 25 times the number of podcast listeners than we do members of our investment research. People are happy to consume the information, but I think to your point, it's like a slow burn to learn about financial education, to go on that path where you're building wealth over a very long time, to actually just ask for 10 bucks a month. <laughs> just People don't want to do it. <laughs> so, it's hard, right? Yeah. yeah. And finance and um, fitness are actually really similar. Same reason people don't want to look at their credit card bill. They don't want to look at what they're eating or their calorie count. Like yeah. it's just, it's confronting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. Um, you, yeah, you said this. You said this quote, uh, and it's from, I took this from an AFR article. Uh, and the quote is, "On the inside, it was two years of the hardest work that I've ever done." End quote. Um, how did you? It seems like that's like a pretty. That's a pretty strong quote. How did you cope during that period? Did you cope? Yeah. Yeah, co- like not coping would mean like I didn't break down. Um, so I did cope. I would say anyone who's listening to this who has ever been a founder will know instantaneously what I mean because anyone who's been a founder has felt how difficult that journey is at some point. Mm. It's not always difficult, but there are some points where you're just like, why would I be? Why am I doing this? I could do other things that are easier, and I wouldn't have to. Mm. I wouldn't have to go through all this pain. So it was hard. I. How did I it was made more hard because Jules stayed, my wife Jules stayed here in um, Australia to finish a medical degree. Oh, right. Okay. So, we did long distance. I was doing long distance relationship with Jules while doing a startup in San Francisco with no money. Um, we only raised $285,000 for the whole business, which sounds like a lot in like in <laughs> sort really. of like personal savings terms but anyone who's run a business knows that $285,000 is like two staff plus overheads so <laughs> $285,000 goes pretty quickly when you're running a business and yeah we just scraped and scraped and scraped along and so it was yeah it was a tough time um and I probably took things very personally and was was more fearful than I needed to be about the consequences of failure I sitting where I sit now I'm seeing hundreds of companies in different levels of success and failure i just realized like honestly like as long as you really give it your your best that's enough and i just i just beat myself up too much along the way i would do it so differently now um if i could do it again as in the the thought process like that's what you're saying you just constantly judge yourself as a failure you compare yourself to others you why aren't i why aren't i as good as patrick collison from stripe 
that would always be the comparison. I'd hmm. be like, Patrick, look at what Patrick's doing at Stripe. Look at what a loser I am. You know, what is it? Comparison is a thief of joy. Hmm. That, you know, I did lots of comparison in the two years I was building my business. Yeah. <laughs> I can tell you I've learned a little bit because I run, I run a little bit now. I'm trying to get faster. And there's pretty much, I'm working my ass off to be right now to be a faster runner. And I would say 30% of your friends are faster than I am today, having done no effort, just just putting on a pair of shoes and going for a run. But at 39 relative to 29, I'm so much better at just being happy with my... The, really, the only person I'm comparing myself to is me six months ago. And I'm so much faster than I was six months ago. So, I don't care how fast your friends are. Like, I'm I'm happy. And, and I think that's the... You need to use another cliche. You need an inner scorecard that, that dictates how you judge yourself because the external one is painful to apply. Mm. Yeah, I often think about it as two compasses, the external one and the internal one. And you want them like, yeah, there's one that's more important, I'd say. Uh, so, you mentioned Startmate before. We had Nikki on the show recently. Can you – like, so, you ended up running that. and I think that was the only outpost, wasn't it, of Startmate? So, Nikki and I – Okay, so in, when I had the digital agency, Native Digital, one of my ideas as an internal project was to launch Y Combinator for Australia. Yeah. So, I went out and started talking to investors about Y Combinator um, and they all were like, yeah, that's not going to work. That's a bad idea. And for various reasons, they're probably probably decent in their reasoning why they told me that. But then I got introduced to Nikki who was doing roughly the same idea, launching an accelerator in Australia. And the second I met him, I was like, I think people who think I'm not going to succeed are probably right. But they're wrong about Nikki because Nikki will make this succeed. So, I just stopped pursuing it and I sold. Yes. I had some Commonwealth Bank shares and I sold them all and put them into Startmate's uh, second cohort. That's <laughs> kind of my first angel investment. What made you think that about Nikki? Uh, we met in a cafe in Darlinghurst and I just – I actually don't remember the thought process except that I came away completely thinking I'm not going to pursue this anymore. I'm just going to put money into his thing. Just like he's going to do it better than I will. <laughs> I mean, he. if you go back to the first 25 people that put money into Startmate, it's all of the godfathers of Australian startups. And Nicky had put himself in a position where that was his peer group. And I was much more, I think, on the outside looking in, starting to meet those people. But I didn't have 25 mates who could put five grand into an accelerator. And, um, and I didn't do it. You know, it's like, it's like um, people who could take um, conceptual art it's like, yeah, you can critique it, but you didn't do it. So, you know, I just didn't, I just didn't do what, what the, I didn't do start, mate, and Nicky did. And so, um, he deserves all the credit. And so, he and I got to know each other through Startmate. He invested, Blackbird obviously invested in sessions, which is how I got to know Nicky and Rick. And so, when it came time to start, Nicky had been running Startmate by himself. He needed help. We used to go to San Francisco as part of the program. And I'd been helping founders. The whole time I was at my fitness pal, I would give them free lunch when they came to San Francisco because we got free lunch like every good startup in San Francisco gets. And yeah, I just, I he asked me to help him find someone to run the US portion of the program. I couldn't find anyone and I thought, I actually would enjoy this. Give me a crack at it. And then three weeks later, I said, can you, are you cool if I get a Blackbird email address? I just think people will respond better to me if I have a Blackbird email address than my Gmail. And then a week after that, I said, do you mind if I come to partner meetings and just listen in just so I can educate myself because it'll help me to help the founders. And sort of without even honestly, without realizing it, I was becoming a Blackbird employee just by asking for things that was common sense at the time that were going to help me. But I didn't have this plan like, oh, I've got to get into VC. It was just like, this is something I really enjoy and it will help me to get better at it if you let me into partner meetings. But then you look at what Blackbird is now I mean, like Blackbird is a success now, right? Like I, I really feel like that's the most successful thing that I've ever been a part of. But I didn't start it. I've been a massive contributor to it, but I didn't start it. And again, you want to talk about luck, mm. you know, it was that coffee with Nikki. It was those early days of just pursuing this interest that I had in helping founders. And then that just, and then I started angel investing and then I would send my ideas to Nikki and say, what do you think about this? And all of it was the perfect way to apply for a job at Blackbird and at no point did I realize that's what I was doing. <laughs> Does anyone else have similar stories to that at Blackbird? Like did anyone 
like you, I guess the question is, the team has grown. Yeah. Is it an unconventional process to work at Blackbird? Not anymore. <laughs> okay. We have job ads. Yeah. Okay. People apply. <laughs> It's unconventional in the sense that when people apply for jobs at Blackbird, they submit a set of responses to three or four questions that we have. And when we score them, each member of the team or each member of the hiring team will score each answer completely blind to who that person is. So when someone applies, we don't know gender, name, LinkedIn, anything. All we know is the quality of the answer they submitted. And then we know that two or three people in our team have scored it at a certain level. So we have a blinded process. So we, we do hire differently. Hmm. But the thing is, when Blackbird was what, three, you see the three or four people when I started hanging around, and I just think that the lesson is when there's three or four people and everyone's just doing their their best, there's always a lot of opportunity just sitting around to help. You know, and again, you anyone who's been an early employee of a startup will know that. And I was lucky that that I was the that was Blackbird for me. Hmm. Yeah, the leverage that comes with venture capital is incredible in terms of you magnify everything is magnified mm. and, the upside and accelerated magnified. Yeah, and accelerated yeah and so to be there at that time yeah i can imagine the like it's obviously been an incredible experience so here's what's funny is when i went to silicon valley in 2012 i was like oh my god i'm so late to this like maybe i missed the boat mm. maybe silicon valley's done and then when we raised money in 2013 i thought venture capital's peaked there's just, you know, if I don't raise money now, like I'll have no chance. Venture capital is going to go away. And then you look back now and everything was so nascent. Like it's, it's, I still just can't believe where the Australian ecosystem has evolved to in the last 10 years. Like it still, still shocks me to, to sit back and go to know where it was in 2016. We're not even talking 2010. We're talking 2016, five plus years later. It's just staggering. Mm. Can you talk to like the I guess the the cohorts or the waves that go through Startmate? I think like obviously the thing that appeals to so many people is it's like successful founders and business operators that can then mentor um, founders. Curious to know how you think that has uh, improved the outcomes, but then also if you're not in that type of situation any strategies that people could use to kind of build on to do that themselves in a way yeah and i don't even think the mentor to founder experience is the valuable part it's the founder to founder experience okay it's being in a cohort with 12 20 others of which three will be lifelong friends and you can pick up the phone at any time to them and celebrate lament whatever you're going through at that point in time mm. So I think I think the most important experience is founder to founder experience and that's why you want to get into a quality accelerator because the quality accelerator is a attract the quality founders and then you're putting yourself in that bucket and i went through an accelerator as a founder it's called rock health in san francisco and i knew that's why i've kind of well set up to help start mate because i'd been a founder who'd gone th gone through the journey who'd gone through an accelerator i knew what was good and what wasn't about it i think the other thing is um i think that community is really helpful but it's probably mostly helpful like I remember I used to, every year I would take the cohorts to the Bug Crowd office. Bug Crowd's 2013 Startmate company, Blackbird Portfolio Company. Mm -hmm. And we used to sit in their kind of three floor office um, down on the water in San Francisco. And they had this downstairs kind of wine cave area where we would, where we would take everyone. And I would just remind people like three years ago, Casey was sitting where you're sitting in the audience listening. And three years later, he's in San Francisco having raised money with um, you know, customers all around the world. And I was like, it was just really powerful to show people a direct line from them to him mm. and have him talk about that direct line and know it, it made possible more real. And so hmm. I think a lot of people sometimes overestimate how far away people have in their mind what success looks like or people who are successful and they will misjudge how close they are to that. And that's what was powerful about Startman is there are now 20 or 30 companies that have gone through Startmate where you can say maybe this year, this cohort, I'm the one that goes on to have the massive impact and the hundreds of employees and to raise money and have customers all around the world. And it just turns that from something that's rare into something that's normal and expected. And so that's the change in people's minds is that they go, I don't know if I can be successful to I know I can be successful. And it changes 
the, the, it puts the control, it flips it from being like, oh, something external has to happen for me to be a success to I can actually drive this myself. Mm -hmm. And lots of people have gone before me and done it and they were no different to me. So it's the founder to founder experience and then the expectation reset. And it's very hard to get an expectation reset in life because it basically involves kind of ditching all everything you know before and just putting yourself in a new environment. And that's what accelerator programs are, just 12 weeks in a completely new environment with a completely new group of people. And that, again, to use a cliche, you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. For an accelerator, that means you're the average of the mentors and the founders in the accelerator. Mm. And that's a great average to readjust yourself to. For sure it is. Um, you know, you mentioned before a little while ago that you worked with a lot of businesses or seen a lot of businesses now. A lot of the, the public markets facing investors that listen to this have a process and a philosophy that they follow. And now in your position, I'm curious, if we just took a sample size of 100 companies, how many of them would make it through to like I guess even start made or into a, a portfolio position? I'm going to assume that those are 100 companies that are seeking to be a venture capital business. Yeah. Of which like there are hundreds of thousands of businesses. There's no distinction between being a venture capital business or being a, um, uh, a milk bar on the corner of the street. They're all businesses and if you, that, if you want to run the milk bar, that's no better or worse than the founder who wants to go raise venture capital and chase chase that dream. I think there can sometimes be this sort of hierarchical thing where venture capital businesses are better or they're not. They're just a, diff, a whole, di you, you called it earlier, it's like they just accelerate everything, they intensify everything and they shorten the timelines for everything and that can be good or it can be bad. It just depends mm. going all the way back. Is that what you want as a founder or not? So when I say that of the 100 businesses, if we're taking just 100 businesses that exist, like zero of them statistically are, are venture fundable. If we say the subset is 100 businesses who are seeking venture funding, maybe one or two, and the likelihood that either of them will be successful is really low. So you actually kind of need <laughs> a thousand venture capital fundable businesses and you need to fund 10 of them to find one that works. But we're talking about minute probabilities of success. How many businesses, roughly speaking, do you think you've seen that are seeking- Defined seen. Like that you've had a meeting with or that have pitched you in some way that are seeking capital? Yeah, so met with is a much smaller number, but the met with number would be t probably between 650 and 750. Hmm. And then the scene would be six to 10,000, somewhere in that range. Wow. Yeah, and then the funded would be 12. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> how, do, how do you go, let's just take that one. How do you go from seen to met with? Like if you could have like, I don't know, just a couple of nuggets. Oh, God. Well. There's the process on the website. So, I'll defer people yeah, to that. Yeah, but no, what you should defer people to is if you Google Nick Crocker Territory 3, we'll put a link in the show yeah, notes. Yeah, sure. But I go into I do a I do a how to how to write a good pitch deck and then I analyze three pitch decks mm -hmm. um, and it's become really it's become a really popular artifact where I get a lot of feedback on it from people going oh, I just watched it for the first time so so the, the answer to what's a good pitch deck it takes an hour you want you wanted three nuggets most important thing is the team like I don't care you, most people will send me a twenty five slide pitch deck I don't I don't even I just ignore the order you send it in I go and find out who the team is because I'm like who's who's the author of this document because and there I'm looking for something that makes me interested and then the second thing is I just do command F and look for a dollar sign because <laughs> I'm like and then I'm looking is it real revenue projected revenue whatever it is and then and then I'll be like okay do these look like interesting people and then I can kind of go is this pre-revenue or, or post-revenue and then I can just go and be like okay maybe I go see what this does but I'm not looking for what it does as a first thing I'm just looking who's this team do I d does this look roughly interesting and I just think people people really stick to that Sequoia pitch deck thing of like problem, solution, market, competition, blah, 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 blah. And then it's like, who's the team? Like a seed deal is just an interesting group of people with an interesting problem and then you're asking for an amount of money. And the amount of money is just a number, just basically the number of people you'll hire in the next two years. Like it's very, it's very simple and most people, I would say 
most people present their businesses worse than they actually are in a pitch deck. As in hmm. meeting someone, I'll actually realize, oh, this business isn't as bad as I thought it was because the way that people just um, kind of massacre their ideas in, in PowerPoint format when they present them <laughs> is just, it's a national tragedy, something <laughs> I'm really passionate about. But nuggets, just keep it way more simple than you think. Yeah, I like that. Um, so, when you say so like that, that, that idea of like command F for the revenue, <laughs> If it was projected versus like if it's actual revenue. If it's projected, it's a it's made up, so I ignore it. So you just ignore it. So you basically, what what are you trying to glean from that then? Just have you got a product? Have you MVP yeah, or so if, yeah, so if it's if it's revenue change like if it's pre revenue, then it's just the team. And if it's post revenue, then you're like, was this growing really fast or not? Then you're starting to go, Okay, if it's a subscription business, how many customers? What's the ACV? Okay, if it's less than five thousand dollars, but they have salespeople, maybe that's not efficient. Oh, it's six thousand dollars. They have no salespeople. They have twenty-five customers. The cost of acquisition is thirty-five dollars. The lifetime value looks like it's about a hundred. Oh, it's interesting. You know, like you, mm. your brain is just running different algorithms versus this is pre-revenue. Okay, it's all a guess. Who's the team? And do I do I roughly think this might be an interesting idea or not? Mm. Yeah. Are there any in? Are there any industries, sectors, problems? themes that you tend to lean to like if you if you just, no, I maybe no. it's like a natural bias <laughs> no. no nothing no. i've got my morse micro a chip company neuro a headphone company eucalyptus a healthcare company dovetail a user research company applied a hiring business culture amber culture business like the through line is just founders that i am energized to work with in a really deep way for a decade mm. And I almost don't care what you're working on, like, because I don't know how your business will evolve, but I do know that you're going to be consistent through the whole thing, likely. Yeah. So that's actually the most important judgment. And that's not necessarily the right way to do this, but it's the way I am building my career. And so I'll be right or wrong on that. And you can build a career and venture many ways, but that's the way I think about it. Just this job would not be fun if you weren't able to enjoy the people you spend time with. I asked a similar question of Nikki when I met with him, which was, do you think that it's becoming easier to be a non-technical founder? Yes. Like low-code tools, open AI, these types of things yes. seem to be moving. Yes, it is. But that doesn't mean it's easier to make a great product. I would say it's just really, really hard to make a great product and the best product people are still technical. I think it's much easier to get the first version of it. We just funded a business who that was kind of running their first product as kind of like, what was it? Yeah, Notion pages and PowerPoint docs and just all hacked together. So it was nice. They might not have got funding five years ago because Notion and Airtable and Webflow didn't exist. Um, so it makes accessibility easier, but it doesn't make the end product being great easier. So more people will try, but probably the same amount of people will succeed. Mm. That's that's interesting. I'm almost certain Nikki gave a different answer. Yeah, I can't remember exactly off the top of my head, and I don't want to. I, just, I dare not paraphrase. <laughs> um, interesting. Okay, so we talked a little bit about at the start of the show, like you said, like there's like maybe like an imbalance in people that somehow leads them down this pathway of. Otherwise, why are you do it? If you balance, you just go get a job and get a holiday house and just have it all be easy, like. Mm. The reason people withstand discomfort is because there's some other discomfort that they're trying to avoid. <laughs> they said that the traditional financial box is like this person has to be stable. They're a professional. They wear a suit. Just you know, whatever. Horseshit. Yeah. No way. It's just I, like I don't know. Like maybe that's right, but how, just think of all the people you know intimately. Like how complex are human beings, especially adults? Yeah. Have had multiple decades. So complex. Tragedy, fear, failure, nervousness imposter syndrome, mm. ego. People are just incredibly complex. The idea that there's a subset of sort of tried and true safe hands leaders management, you know, everyone's slightly weird when you get to know them. <laughs> yeah. I guess it's when they're weird and talented, <laughs> it's probably the that's common- my, That's our sweet spot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. When they're doing, sometimes like I had a, someone tell me recently- let, let me be clear. If you're the CEO of a regulated business in banking, well, but even then I think they're probably all, the, like they're probably all slightly weird because who would want to withstand the pain that it would need to take to be the CEO of a regulated bank? 
Like the, you must, something weird must be driving you to withstand that amount of pain. Yeah. Maybe it's just that people are so busy they don't have, they don't give themselves the time for introspection. Yeah, for the best sometimes, I think. <laughs> <laughs> they just do. They Ultima- don't think. Ultimately, you, just- come on, you ultimately unravel if you don't introspect, but for a while, you know, introspection doesn't always lead to places you want it to. That's interesting. We assume introspection is a good, some pe- like if some people introspected and really faced up to who they were, that, that you know. This is something, so I was, we have, um, we have these, uh, we call them rest treats because it's like a play on retreat. <laughs> yeah. Pretty simple. <laughs> but, uh, I remember getting up in front of the guys and we all did these five minute presentations. Everyone in the team does. It can't be on f- something you study, can't be on something that you do at work. I can't even remember what I did to be honest. But someone did like um, gabbins or gab- gaboons or something like monkeys or something. And I was like, that's that's weird. Another one did it on bees. And there's all these different snake bites, all this sort of stuff, right? But I, I remember saying like, and I think people were shocked when I told them this, that I think this business has started through my anxiety, like my phobia of money and my fear of not having money is a super anxiety because I didn't have money growing up. And that is the thing that enabled this thing to start. 100%. You're 100% right about that. And I was, I, I thought that's a very, they probably, I think they all looked at me like I was, had like two heads or something. And I was like, no, that's actually true. That's the first time I've ever said it. Yeah. You know, do you think a lot of founders would have that? Like, They wouldn't see it as clearly as you do. But there would be some equivalent, some, like, again, why would you want so much pain? Why would you want to absorb so much pain if you were not running from something equally painful or being driven by something equally, mm. th- that drive has to come from somewhere. And it's not just, I want to be a great person and shine sunlight on the world. Like mm. everyone has darkness in them that is a part of who they are. And I just don't, I just think we just don't talk about that sort of as Hmm. I, I think we're kidding ourselves if we don't acknowledge that. Yeah. Um, yeah, because I guess the if we lean towards rationality, we're probably less inclined to. You probably there are fewer outliers. You probably don't have that that thought process to think. Yeah, I've got this really good thing here. I think some people. I think there. Maybe I'm being too stereotypical here. I think there are some people who go through it as from a pace, place of balance and they do do remarkable things through really calculated risk-taking. I'm definitely not one of those people. But I think- What's your would, best example? I, I, I don't have any off the top of my head necessarily. Oh, I've got a mate. Okay, I've got a mate who started a, um, a financial planning business and super well-balanced. You sure? Well, he seems. <laughs> he seems balanced. <laughs> like he, he- Okay, yeah, he seems from the outside, like external compass and all that. But he seems balanced and he did heaps of research. He had like- dozens and dozens of pages on his business and he seemed really content and humble with what he was going to achieve. He didn't want the world. Yeah. And he went and did that and his business, basically he, because he's a financial planner, had only one person with him. He basically filled up and within two months and his business was shut for new business. And I thought, well, that's great. It's not really like he's not going for 100x, so maybe that's a bit of a point of difference, but- Sounds like a good life to me. Yeah, that's what he wanted. Bingo. Yeah. That's the key though. Most people don't know what they want. Yeah, true. Um, that actually leads me to a question around the teams, actually, is like the decay that you get in building a team, uh, in investing. Like, say, actually, I'll take a venture capitalist, for example, right? I feel like if you have one incredible venture capitalist, yeah, you can get a lot done. I feel like this is my outside opinion, right? You, your your skill is in identifying company companies, peoples, people, etc. But we see this in public equities uh, and investment teams, where the more people you add, the more complexity you get, and probably the there's a decay in the outcome, like incrementally. Do you think about that a lot? All the time, all the time, and you have to be so conscious about that change in your organization and we've definitely gone through it now we have 70 people 70 people Mm. on any given day at least two of them have a problem that needs to be solved that's that's going to rise up to me or one of the partners we talk about it as the craft of venture capital and protecting our craftspeople Mm. from the management of running a 70 person business 
And we have been very deliberate about splitting those two parts out. We have our craftspeople who do the craft of venture and we have the executive leadership group. And this is all very new. This is something, this is a response that we have developed in as uh, Nikki, Rick, Sam and I have sort of built our venture careers. We've increasingly had to take on also firm building. And I think this year we have acknowledged that firm building needs a, de a, a dedicated team and investing needs a dedicated team. And the more you blend those, the more you dilute the quality of each. I think the other thing I probably learned actually was it was Kevin Plank, the CEO of Under Armour, who I think um, taught me this the most is that as your team gets bigger and Under Armour was thousands of people when I was there. So mm. it's really culture is just repeated storytelling and you just pick the stories that you're going to tell your team. So he would just always tell a story about how he would pack everything from the basement of his grandma's house in Baltimore and how uh, when he was on any given Sunday, um, they asked him to give the product for free and he made them pay for it. Like there was these stories that he would just say over and over and over to dictate to people what the culture of Under Armour was. And so that's the other thing that I think about is two things. One is that the stories that get told internally generally bubble up from the bottom. They're stories that actually happen and people just repeat them because they're a perfect example. So at our, our Blackbird, the classic one for us is we have this we have this thing internally that we talk about. It's called taking out the bins where everyone's expected to take out the bins. <laughs> but the story we tell about that is when we first hosted our Sunrise Conference in New Zealand, um, Nikki and Rick as the founders, they're less well known in New Zealand than they are in Australia. And there we had a shortage of people scanning people in at the door so nikki and rick at the beginning of sunrise conferences <laughs> thousands of entrepreneurs are streaming and are just out the front scanning people's tickets in and no one knows any difference and then 15 minutes later they're on stage giving the welcoming keynote and so we could tell people hey um it's really important that we all chip in and no one cares about that or doesn't connect or we can tell them the story of nikki and rick scanning people in at sunrise and that's how people acknowledge that that is what our culture is. So I think there's a structural part of building the business and then there's a very important curated part of building a business, which is which stories do you choose to tell new people about what it means to be a blackbird? And you have to be really conscious about what those are. They're very, very deliberate. And then I'll give you one other thing that I think about a lot. It was Dennis Crowley, who's the CEO of Foursquare, who said this. He said, until you have repeated yourself so much that you feel like vomiting, your team has not heard the message you are trying to get through. And I actually think, I do this at Blackbird, I talk about what we do as, building a, as growing up a forest. Investment team plants trees. The operations team protects them from fire and flood. The founder success team makes sure that that, that tree gets fertilizer and grows. The building Blackbird team, which is our internal team that looks after Blackbird, they're focused on making sure everyone who's a gardener in our team is looked after. But every time I do that, people roll their eyes and I know that the message has got through because they're rolling their eyes because they know what's coming next, which means they know the story. Yeah. And I just think the, the power of repetition of the right stories is such a critical decision as a founder. Mm. Yeah, I, uh, I think about that scale a lot and leading by example. Have you ever read the book Sapiens? Yeah. Yeah talks about tribes and communication is what brought humanity together basically just people telling stories that may or may not be true yeah yeah and that's how i think about um companies this is tribes of people to your point around focusing on just believing a story that is partly a story yeah well that's what intellectual property rights are you, you know you're trained as a lawyer it's basically everyone just believing that something bad will happen if if you don't follow the rules 100 percent. so people sometimes think like man, look at all the bad stuff that, that happens in society. People must be bad. I'm like, look at all the bad stuff that doesn't happen. People, I think people are better than we think they are. Like, I think of all the chaos that could happen that just doesn't because we all just choose to agree to kind of roughly follow the rules. Mm. I don't know. I, I totally agree with you. Mm. A lot of business owners, whether they're small, more micro, small, medium, large, people tend to get really busy. Yeah. How do you think about escaping that and making sure that you spend time on the business, not in the business? Like, do you have any strategies for that? Or? Oh, it's brutal. Because the really the key decision that you make in that is to start to say no to things that you used to say yes to. Yeah. And if you're someone that is a pleaser or likes, tries to control how other people think about you and tries to be liked, you're just going to say yes too much. 
Mm. And every yes takes you away from the thing you actually should do. And so, the more you grow up and the more responsibility that you have, the more ruthless you have to be in terms of the things you say no to. And saying no to things is honestly not that much fun. I would say the the thing that I don't, I don't need sympathy as a venture capitalist, but know that my job is just saying no to 98 things a week that I wish I could say. I genuinely wish I could do them. I wish I could meet that person. I wish I could go do this. I wish I could fund that founder. I'm saying no to founders that are way better than I ever was at founding businesses, but it's just no, 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 no. It's a great, um, the, the guy who just set the marathon world record, I'm not going to um, mispronounce his name, but he said, um, the most important thing in life is to take vitamin N and that's to say no <laughs> to everything except what matters to you. So, I would say um, that's, the, that's the reason most people kind of cap out at some point is they aren't able to differentiate between the good things and the great things that they should do and they say yes to the good things and never, never find the time for the great and it is so <laughs> draining to keep that discipline up. It would be so much easier just to say yes but um, yeah, the most powerful thing you can do is to say no to things that are good but not great. Mm. I think I need to heed that advice. We all do. I do every yeah. day because you have to wake up and do it every day. It's just it's pure discipline, and it's not enjoyable. There's no the only reward for it is is higher quality work. I, I think Didier Culture always says my reward for solving a big problem is a bigger problem to solve. <laughs> like it's not you can't be you can't be hoping that the reward will be the solving of the problem. The reward is the chance to solve the problem itself. And the reward is that you get bigger and bigger and harder problems to solve. But I've really, I've really struggled to learn that. And so I think about it every day and I have a set of rules and I have an EA now. Um, shout out Becca who just knows what my rules are. And then she just tells me like, you're breaking your own rules. Like you, you said to schedule the meeting, but you clearly said to me, don't do more than four and a half hours of Zoom calls in a day. This is five and a half hours. Do you want to break the rule? So, it's just it's mm-hmm. just sticking to the rules that you set yourself. No meetings on Wednesday. This is going to be a Wednesday meeting. You said to schedule it. You sure? You told me you didn't want to do it. You're like, it's- yeah. We're recording on a Wednesday, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> this is fun, though. This, this, this is something I enjoy. Um, but yeah, Wednesday is for things like this. Um, anyway- the discipline mm. of saying no is super underrated. Mm. I like that. So, I've got two final questions for you, mate. And these are, take them however you want, really. Uh, is What's one thing you believe about business? And we'll separate business from investing. What's one thing you believe about business that few people would agree with you on? I think we touched on it before. But I think the thing that confuses me, like I still feel it's hard to know exactly where I am, whether I'm early or late. I still feel early in my journey of learning about business does feel like an infinite game that Mm. you just you complete a level you get to a new level but there's an infinite levels above it the thing that that is that we talked about that just doesn't make sense to me that is that when people talk about businesses i just don't understand how they can really know unless they know the actually know the founding team and you just can't get that unless you are it's one of the best things about vcs you actually when you're the first investor and the company's three people you actually get that yeah um, but I just don't know how, as a public markets investor, you could make a decision about management without going and actually getting to know them. Yeah. And so, I think that's a probably an unpopular view. I probably think there'll be people here like, you are an idiot when I, <laughs> to hear me say that. And maybe I am, but that's the thing that I can't resolve in my head that seems that other people have resolved. I don't think that, that you're an idiot, but um, I think that's... Your yeah, philosophies are shaped by our experiences, right? So, you've got a certain set yeah. of experiences. Exactly. Um, the final one then is like, what's one thing you believe about investing that few people would agree with you on? I still think startups are super underrated. The opportunity to invest a million dollars at the big, to be the first million dollars. And what's a million dollars? It's five people for a year and a half. You're like, it sounds like a million dollars is like one day I hope to be a millionaire. And so it still has a country kind of, you see the, you see the sort of articles like entrepreneur makes $40 million overnight. And you're like, no, they sold $40 million of product and you don't know the margin because you don't know how much they pay to acquire those customers. Like it's not $40 million in their pocket. So, so I'm always like, you know, I, if I say at a barbecue, yeah, we invest about a million dollars into seed rounds, people's minds explode at the size of that amount of capital. But it's five people for eighteen months. Like it's yeah, 
it's not much <laughs> in a weird way. But the opportunity to do that, to give, to take, take, um, uh, to take that money and to give it to someone to go and pursue inventing something new in the world. I still don't think people realize how incredible that opportunity is. Mm. And that, and it, that it doesn't matter if 90 of the people that go on that journey lose the money and the thing they choose to do doesn't work out. Because if you half decent at this, you're going to find 10 or one person that goes on to make up for all the mistakes of the others in a financial sense. And you can't know at the start who's going to be successful. So you kind of need 100 people to go and have a crack at things because life's unknowable. So I just think startup investing, people think of it as like risky or, but I think it's, it's, it's just such a profound way to shape an economy. And I feel so privileged to be able to do that. Mm. And like just the opportunity to give someone a million dollars to go work with the five smartest people they know to solve a problem for 18 months and where that can lead is just extraordinary. And I think people don't appreciate that enough. Mm. That's great. Fantastic way to end the conversation, Nick. I really appreciate you taking the time to come all the way into the city and uh, spend this time with me. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Australian Investors Podcast, which is proudly supported by JP Morgan Asset Management. JP Morgan Asset Management provides opportunities to strengthen and diversify investment portfolios through alternative income strategies with the JP Morgan Equity Premium Income ETF, or ASX JEPI, J-E-P-I, currently the world's largest active ETF with assets under management of US $25.49 billion dollars as at the 16th of May, 2023. For more information, you can visit the JP Morgan Asset Management website by visiting am.jpmorgan.com slash au. That's am.jpmorgan.com slash au.